We're into the serious weather, there's no doubt of that. It's the sort of weather you look out for if you clear and you say, nah, I'm not going. I'll get your coat on and get out there and don't be cut off at all. You said about the eclipse, Philip, and I have to say, I was extremely huffed by the eclipse. I have a beautiful, clear southeasterly horizon from, from where I live in Bangor. And on the Friday night, it was glorious, and I thought, <laughs> on the Saturday night, completely clouded, I sat, at the, I sat at the golf club and I looked at cloud for a few quarters of an hour. And of course, on Sunday night, it was beautiful, and uh, such is the strong night. So I haven't had any interest in that eclipse whatsoever. Actually, I'm very, very, very little interest in the sun either. And Peter's not here because Ryan's going to tell us all about the sun shortly. The sun has actually been quiet this week. Um, anybody who's been keeping their eye on it, it's been sort of covered in buckshot recently. There's been lots of little tiny, tiny activity centres. This is actually the sun yesterday, but I'll put today on it. Um, you can see there's an activity uh, coming around the corner here. So hopefully that will develop into something interesting. Now usually what I do is I say, it's been fantastic and we're going to see auroras. And I'll show you a picture of an aurora. I'm not going to do that because I'm just jarred off doing that as well. Because we haven't seen any auroras yet. But was anybody on the Tromso trip? Well, there's been auroras every, every single night for the last three nights in Tromso. Beautiful auroras too. So, sooner or later we're going to get one, don't worry. But the sun's still worth a look. There's some spots on it. And we'll hear a lot more about that in a moment or two. Um, just as interesting as the sunspots is, uh, is Comet Lovejoy. Again, I'm not going to say too much because Ryan's going to tell us a little bit more about it. But this is, uh, this is Comet Lovejoy here. I think at the start of this imaging sequence, it's only uh, a few images, but at the start of it was about magnitude 8.5, and it's, it's, it's got slightly brighter as it approaches the sun in this, and it went up to about 6. So, in theory, you could have seen it if it, if it wasn't uh, blinded by the glare of the sun. A bit like a round belt there. I'm not sure that it was. But anyway, it, it's, a, it's a member of a family of comets called the Kreutz Comet, which is actually uh, a comet which broke up, they think, uh, a single comet. There's lots of these things almost every day they crash into the sun. And uh, it's part of a, a huge comet, which they think was the great comet of 1109 or something like that. But uh, there's quite a few of them. And if you keep your eye on the Space Weather site, you'll see these big comets from time to time flashing towards the sun. Don't do that on it. Okay, now we always go back to the moon from time to time, but very rarely when the moon's full. And I think this was a day, just, just almost before, I think it was a day before full moon, and Paul sent us this wee image. And it's a part of the moon which is actually quite difficult to see. I'm not going to risk the pointer, but you can see the bit at the top here which is quite sharp. And that's actually the Mare Orientale, which is difficult to see because it's right on the edge. And it's one of these uh, uh, impact basins. And in Paul's photograph here, you can just see these mountains, these Rook or Cordiali? Anyway, those, those mountains which are only visible if you get the moon in the right place. So even when the moon's full or almost full, it is, it is worth having a look at it. You, you might see something interesting. Um, Cordiali, sorry. Uh, and you can see the, the, the this is obviously a, a, a lunar orbiter type photograph, and you can see the huge impact base and, and what it's done is it's set up a series of ripples that have turned into the Rook and the Cordiali mountains. Probably hard to see. And again, here's a wee image here. You can see it right down the edge, and the mountains are sort of rippling along the edge. I have to say, after Paul sent me the photograph, I took a wee photograph myself, and it was very similar to this fella here. You can, you can see them because this uh, blob up here is Crater Grimaldi, and it's quite near to the, to the limb. Now, it's a Mare Orientale. Can anybody tell me why it's, uh, what, what Orientale means, first of all? Eastern Sea. The Eastern Sea. Where is it? In the west. It's in the west. It's on the west of the moon, of course. So uh, look out for that. But this is uh, this is a wee region of the moon that's coming up. It's one of my favourite areas of the moon, and the reason being, it's dead easy to find. I find the moon incredibly difficult to navigate, but uh, experience you see a little bit more and a little bit more. And it's uh, it's uh, it's part of the Embraer Basin here, another huge impact basin, which is very easy to see in the moon. And around the edge of it again, you can see these mountains have risen up, and they're very dramatic. In, in, most telescopes, and a, a very famous crater down here, Copernicus, it's one of our favourites. But um, the object that I, I like looking at is Plato, and it's quite dark, it's got quite a dark floor. Obviously the lava has spilt into it, and under very good seeing conditions, you can look out for, there's a number of little tiny craters in there, and actually there's some rills which you can spot under exceptionally good conditions, and I have seen those from time to time. So it's always worth going in and having a look. And of course, right next to Orient, you've got the Alpine Valley, um, the idea is that something came in at a, a fairly uh, obscure angle and, and took, took a mountain out there, so 
That looks like a fairly dramatic <coughs> impact. But that, that area of the moon, very easy to find and, and very pretty and worth photographing if you can. Okay, turning to the sky. The sky is hugely interesting at this time of year. It's beautiful. Um, if you look over towards the north, our favourite group of stars, the Plow. Um, and the Plow at the moment is uh, Vega on one side and Capella on the other side, moving ever higher up. And you can see over here we've still got the stars of summer. We've got part of the summer triangle. Down in here we've got Altair. But you look out and you still see Dena, which is part of Cygnus. So those stars are very easy to find. And then of course the two stars in this part of the Plow point directly to the pole star. And up above it, half of it is Cassiopeia. So when the plow is down low, Cassiopeia is up high. All right. Over into the eastern part of the sky, you can see the stars of winter, and even the stars of spring are starting to push up. And uh, I saw some of the the other evening, quite a bit of it actually. Um, but of course, the, the real star of the show at the moment is probably the most famous constellation of them all. You've got Orion, and Orion will say a little bit more about it in a moment. Um, this part of the sky is, is, is fabulously rich in, stu in, in bright stars. And we always look out for the three bell stars. And Orion for beginners, um, and this is supposed to be tilted towards beginners, Orion is very good as a, as a sort of constellation that helps you find your way to other constellations. So for example, if you go in this direction down towards the horizon, you come to the brightest star in the sky, which isn't Polaris, okay? It's Sirius, and you'll see Sirius twinkling there very close to the horizon most evenings. If you go the other way, you come up to Aldebaran, which of course is the, the bright star in Taurus the Blue, and up above it the little Pleiades twinkling away. And if you go in this direction, you go to Gemini and the Twins. Okay, so that part of the sky is very, very interesting. Over here, it gets a little bit vague, certainly for me. I can't see any of this from Bangor, it's all just an orange blur. But still, if you come out, you'll see um, the great square of Pegasus that dominates this part of the sky all through, uh, all through the, the autumn and early, early winter. And of course, Jupiter, shining high above the university this evening, is still very much to the fore. Okay, that's a, that's a photograph which I took and showed last year. It's, uh, it's a pretty fair photograph. It's taken with my wife's uh, compact camera. It's got a little setting on it where you can, you can expose for 15 seconds. But hey, it gives you a fair view out my back garden. And you can see here's a lion rising over, over my roof. Um, but you can see the nice colour that I have. This is the Aurora Bangoras. There's a much better photograph of Orion, and you can see the bright stars up in the uh, up in the corner. It's probably the most famous star, perhaps in the whole in the whole sky, Betelgeuse, and um, which I'm told in Arabic means armpit. So you can see, see the armpit star there, and down here, beautiful Rigel. Well, well Betelgeuse is a, a red giant star. And it's very interesting when you look at Orion to compare <coughs> Rigel, which is a blue white giant, with Betelgeuse, which is a red giant. And uh, the, the colour difference is quite startling, even for people who have difficulty seeing colour in stars. And then you have the three belt stars, a very interesting area down below the belt stars. For beginners, it's probably the number one object at this time of year, M42, or the Great Nebula in, in Orion. And you see there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff happening in that photograph. And here's an even better photograph taken by Martin Campbell. Um, you can see in Martin's. Uh, photograph, he's used a camera where, where the red sensitivity has been enhanced. Now that's been done by taking out the little filter inside the camera and you can see this whole region of Orion, which is starbirth re region, is, is completely full of glowing nebula and uh, this particular loop is called Barnard's Loop and it's very famous and uh, you can see in here there's some nebulosity and up at the top there's a huge blob of nebulosity and down here is the Great Nebula. That's a fabulous wide field. You can see it's made up of a, a mosaic of, of photographs and uh, you simply couldn't count the number of stars in here. Fabulous photograph. And this is a photograph of the Orion Nebula. Actually with modern, uh, even digital SLR cameras, you should be able to get photographs which look something like that. At this time of year there's a huge interest in people buying beginner's telescopes and they come and they bring their astronomy magazines and they say, is this what I'm going to see? Now, obviously, for a beginner, this is not what you're going to see. The first thing is you'll not see any colour in the sky. The colours only appear in long exposure photographs. Or even now with our digital SLRs, shoot relatively short exposure photographs. But you should be able to take photographs not too far away from that. Or some people can. David can. Some of us can't. But anyway, beautiful object. Okay, meteors, I'm not on to another disappointment. Um, whenever I opened my Yahoo yesterday, this, this was a message which greeted me. Geminids, Brits may see up to 40 meters per hour. And then I had this little photograph above it. Anybody see a deliberate mistake? 
So I don't know. Apart from Terry, it's not me. It's a little satellite, probably the ISS, I don't know. But it was, it was great that they were, they were interested in trying to get people to look at the sky. Um, probably the best time to see the Geminids, which is a very, very reliable and a very good shower, was probably last night. But if you're out tonight, it clears up a bit. Um, it was quite clear coming in there. You might be able to see some of the bright Geminids. Unfortunately, the moon is interfering at the moment, uh, although the radiant is nice and high. But unfortunately, prospects are probably pretty poor. Probably slightly more encouraging. Um, I'm sorry, here's the Geminids radiant. Geminids, the radiance in Gemini. Anybody who's been out looking, you can see Gemini right up there and right next door to you. There's, there's the room as well. Okay, another shower which is much weaker than the Geminids, but the good news is the, the moon's out of the way, and round right about the 22nd, and um, the, 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 the Ursids will peak. And the Ursids, of course, the radiant for it, and the Ursa, oh, I jumped ahead there. Well, the radiant for the Ursids is up uh, around Kokab, which is one of the brighter stars in Ursa Minor, so it's way up high again, um, and you might see a few bright meteors there. Okay, Jupiter, and we're observing this Friday, which I think is the 17th, isn't it? One of the highlights for um, anybody who looks at Jupiter is, of course, the great red spot. If you're fortunate enough to get home, say around about 10 o'clock tonight, um, the great red spot will be right on the centre of the planet. So it always makes Jupiter a little more interesting. Although it's called the great red spot, at the moment it's a sort of a picky yellowy colour. It's not particularly strong, but it is nice to see it on the, on the disc. And hopefully on Friday night or Saturday night, We'll maybe see uh, the great red spot. Sorry, there is that radiant, and you can see here's Kokab. And I don't know whether you can see the outline of the little bird or not, coming up the Polaris here, but the radiant is quite high up in the sky, which is, which is good. You just have a better chance of, of seeing some meteors. I was chatting to someone earlier on about Venus. Um, some of you may have glimpsed Venus, it's very, very low down, roughly about 40 minutes to an hour after sunset. If you look low in the southwestern part of the sky, you might just see it. And on the 27th, it'll be quite close to a nice moon. So uh, if you're struggling <coughs> to tell the difference between the moon and Venus, the moon is the one just above it there. Hopefully you're not. <laughs> um, also, um, this is, I've just put this up because it's a nice photograph. quite like it, but you know, uh, around about that period as well, you might be able to see this. It's called the, the old moon in the new moon's arms. It's very, very pretty. And I think if you do see it, you should try to take a photograph and send it in to me and start us. Okay, now a lot of people, unfortunately a lot of astronomers, go to their grave and they've never seen Mercury. Lots of people are very keen to see Mercury. I have only seen it once in the morning sky. I've seen it many, many times in the evening sky, but I very rarely see it in the morning sky. Now I'm going to have a go at it because uh, it's actually visible um, towards the end of the month, right about the 21st. Uh, whenever you're there for Santa, you might get up early and have a look and see Saturn, the Moon, and way down there, Mercury down the southeast. And I say my southeastern sky is pretty good. Unfortunately, it's the only part of the sky that's any good, but there's an opportunity around about the 21st. Again, on the 23rd, there's a nice moon. In case you're struggling to identify Mercury, it'll be quite bright. And uh, if you are scanning for Mercury with binoculars, make sure that the sun has not come up in the morning sky. The worst thing you can do is catch a glimpse of the sun. Okay? So there'll be a nice moon and Mercury, and down here you might even see Antares. So that's your chance to see Mercury in the morning sky. Okay, last picture, um, this is, uh, I have to say, we saw this picture, I think it's fantastic. And we tend to forget that there are space probes still up there, working away. And this is good old Cassini, which has been absolutely fabulous for NASA. And you can see here it's got four moons. The first one, of course, is the biggest, Saturn's biggest moon. William, what is it? He's not here. Anybody else want to get Peter? Do you want to get <laughs> this one's Titan. What about this one? Dione. Dione's famous because it's got these ice cliffs, it's a really, really pretty moon. And the third one is over here. Okay. Anybody know what that one is? Travis. Quite, yeah. quite right. Nope. Yeah. Mimus. It's not as good as that actually. Yeah. I forgot what you call it. <laughs> <laughs> but the last one, can anybody say it here? That's yeah. Pan. Pan. Do you know what that gap is? It's called Pan. Well, do you know what the big gap is? This one here. That's a Cassini. Yeah. So this one is the okay. Okay. That's the vision. So I just thought it was a fabulous <coughs> photograph. Okay. Um, and this is one of the brighter ones. Just, just going in my head. All right. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks, Andy. Thank you.